Alrighty, welcome everybody. I'm joined here by Andrew Pender. Most of you know him as Moonglade. He's the talented Zerg player from Brisbane, Australia, my own hometown. He's fresh off the back of an impressive streak in the WCS America Premier League. And in just over 48 hours, he's going to be taking on Ryung from Team Axiom live at the MLG studio in New York City for the opening match of the WCS America Finals. So, how you doing Andy? How you, uh, how you been preparing over the last week? Uh, not doing too bad, man. I've been playing a lot of ZVT mostly, and a little bit of ZVP on the side. Uh, but yeah, mostly just really cracking hard for Ryung. Hopefully I can uh, pull out some, uh, some interesting strategies and uh, beat him. Mm -hmm. Now, um, for those of you who don't know, it's like 30 hours travel from Australia to LA and then New York. So you would have had a, a pretty long time spent on planes and airports and stuff. Do you have any particular memorable incidents or memories or anything from that trip? Um, hmm, let me think. I I watched it, my first uh, Korean drama on the plane. <laughs> that was probably the most. Uh, a Gentleman's Dignity. <laughs> Tell us actually, about A Gentleman's Dignity. It was actually pretty interesting. It was about, a, about four guys. Four guys who are, who are they're kind of like players. And they go out and they drink and meet girls and do all the, do all the cool stuff. And... Uh, yeah, it kind of just follows their drama, and they like one guy, the the most player of them all, like, the most baller guy, like falls in love with a girl, but she's not interested. She's in love with another guy, so it's like a triangle of love, and then still this bullshit happens, and it was really entertaining. Um, it was pretty fun. I, I think I'll watch more K, uh, Korean dramas in the future. <laughs> so, how did you get on top of that? Like, who suggested that to you? Surely it came from someone. <laughs> uh, Jake, um, Shockwave. <laughs> he hooked me up, man. He, he knows all about the Korean dramas. He's our, uh, our local connection to Korea. Our oh, yeah. white boy who knows everything Korean. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Very Absolutely. cool. So, I guess we'll be hearing more about uh, this show from you in the future. <laughs> mm -hmm. In Canada, man. Cool. Now, as for the journey itself, uh, any issues that you ran into along the way, or is it a pretty smooth trip? Uh, it, was, uh, it was a very smooth trip, actually. I, I'm always worried when I go to LAX after our, uh, <laughs> our trip to MLG. Um, kind of scared of that place and scared about getting screwed over, but uh, yeah. it was really smooth sailing the whole way. That's really so, good, uh, man. Yeah, I was really happy. Very glad to hear it. Yeah, for those of, uh, those of you who aren't familiar, we had one hell of a trip going to MLG Dallas last year as a team. Uh, where we basically got stranded in LAX for, what was it, like six or eight hours because our yeah, you know, man. connecting flight was cancelled and we couldn't get to Houston because we were going to Houston, uh, going via Houston to Dallas and, oh my god, our luggage was lost for two days and it was just a crisis on top of a nightmare. It was so bad. Yeah. Really glad you didn't have to go through that again. <laughs> yeah, me too, man. It was the most scary thing. Yeah, <laughs> everything else was awesome. Cool, glad to hear it, man. Now, um, for your uh, your journey so far through WCS, obviously um, you were invited directly to the Premier League uh, round of 32, uh, mm -hmm. where you played against Delusion in the opening round, and you fell to him. Uh, I think I believe it was one to two. Oh, sorry, yeah, one to two. Um, and then you played against Maker in the next round, and that was also was that a one to two, or did you beat him two zero? Uh, I think that was it was two one. Yeah, I beat him two one. Cool. It was a bit, sh a bit shaky, that one. Yeah. And then you came back and made a really, really strong performance against Illusion uh, in the qualifying match for the round of 16, which was a 2-0. Is that correct? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Cool. So one thing that we can really identify between the round of 32 and the round of 16 is you have had a really consistent theme of, like, slugfest victories against Terrence. It's <laughs> like, it hasn't really been dominating or one-sided or anything like It's been really back and forth really calculated big long macro games strong economy maps getting mined out all that sort of stuff is this something mm. we can expect to see more of against Ryung or have you worked on refining your play a little bit more um well I've definitely been yeah working on a lot um both all ins and and macro trying to figure out uh, kind of the best style I should go with and um, I'm still a bit undecided currently so I'll probably take today to like really figure things out a bit more but um Hopefully they don't go to that slugfest. Uh, it's very stressful and very long. Uh, but um, I guess it's only one player to, this time. It's best of five, so I, I'll have the endurance for it. Um, but yeah, I'm not entirely sure how Ryung plays. He could be very aggressive, so maybe the games will never go that long. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think I, I can take it 
uh, late game or early game. Uh, I'll, I'll see how he plays in the day and I'll kind of adjust what I'm going to do based on that, whether it be some fancy all-ins or um, some uh, some long, long-winded long macro games, maybe <laughs> some some other cool stuff i got planned. Hopefully we see a few more of those squeezed in there. They're, uh, they're pretty pretty intense to watch from our end, man. Gotta yeah. say. <laughs> Dude, uh, after that that third game with STC, I was uh, I was sweating, man. I was I don't think I've ever sweated that much in a game. I was just uh, so exhausted. I bet that was crazy, man. I think uh, you had most of Australia sweating as well. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, these uh, this this preparation you've been putting towards Ryung, have you studied many of his games? Is there much out there to really get a good look at? Uh, I looked for everything I could I could possibly find in like GSL and GSTL and ASU Story Cup team games. Um, it wasn't that many, to be honest. Um, one of these games, he's like Proxy Rex Reapering, and the, the other game it was just like a, a standard macro game, pretty much, with the Marine Lion, so I didn't have much to go on, so I'm kind of just being preparing for everything, so I, I at least know what I'm going to do against everything, and um, take it from there. Okay. Now, um, for a quick recap on the round of 16 uh, in New York last week, in game one against Crank, you had a, a kind of a perfectly calculated counter build to what he yeah. was opening with on uh, on Whirlwind, and that was really impressive. Everyone was just like, <laughs> is he blindly just doing this? It was just people going crazy, and I mean, there were so many people that didn't quite recognize it. This is the result of studying your opponent's openings on a specific map and knowing exactly uh, what his vulnerabilities are. So, I mean, clearly, you went into that game very confident that you knew exactly how it's going to play out from start to finish, yeah? Yeah, well, uh, to be honest, he did he did the build that I wasn't expecting, but it worked anyway. <laughs> <laughs> As I thought... It's like the last few times I've seen him play on um, well and T's always does gate first. Yeah. And you'd obviously completely destroy a gate first with that style. Um, yeah. But instead he did forge fast, but he kind of just left his wall open, as most Protosses do at that point, especially. Mm -hmm. But um, usually when people go forge, they, they scout at the same time, but he never scouted. So yeah. he was kind of like, he was risking a lot. And uh, yeah, I was pretty happy with how that all turned out. <laughs> um, uh, but unfortunately, I kind of bungled the other two games. I, yeah. I don't know. My uh, my mind kind of just destroyed itself after the first game. And I was just like, second game, I was like, man, I haven't played a game on Cloud Kingdom in a very long time. And mm. I should have gone for Vipers in hindsight, but uh, what was I going to do? I forgot, what, I forgot my plan. I think it was going to be Hydra and Muta, but then I was like, saw so many Phoenix. So I was like, I'll just make Corruptors and make a make a push of it, but it was kind of a bad call, and I lost too many Hydras trying to sack his dead, and um, it all kind of fell apart after that, so, hmm. and I was like, then game three, I, I was really ahead, but uh, I didn't really take advantage of it at all, I decided to make roaches, and then just never defend properly my main base, oh, all three bases, and I took a lot of damage from Harass, and he got back into it somehow, and yeah, that was a pretty uh, demoralizing game. <laughs> I bet. I'm um, not a fan of uh, CVP currently. Okay. There was um there was a lot of discussion uh, globally and especially amongst the, the Southeast Asian community, obviously, because you know you're kind of uh, really in the spotlight at the moment. No pressure. <laughs> um, <laughs> about uh, that third game on, I think I think it was Belshia Vestige. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and it seemed to a lot of people that you were kind of hesitant to use Vipers. Was that really the case, or was it just a matter of, like, you kind of smelled blood in the water and you just wanted to go in for that kill? Uh, it was more going for that kill, but um, I didn't really... I wasn't really thinking properly. I was kind of like, I'm just going to kill... I, like, if they... If you can beat... If you completely, like, destroy their, like, their TT opening, you can pretty much kill them with uh, roaches, mm. to a point. Like... I almost killed him. I killed his third base. I killed like most of his army, but yeah. he he held on, and I didn't really transition properly from him. Mm. Um, ultimately, I should have just gone mutilists. Uh, that would have won me the game, hundred mm -hmm. percent. But uh, uh, probably when I I did have that army at the end, um, hydras, roaches, uh, vipers would have been the best, absolutely. Um, usually, in like a game where I'm in a better frame of mind, I would probably make. Um, Vipers, but yeah, that game was just it's kind of a mess after that roach attack, so I, I don't know I've, I've fixed a lot since then my ZVP is a lot better uh, I had definitely like thought about it a lot after that series and um, 
it was kind of embarrassing for me to be honest. I was I was feeling pretty ashamed of those games. <laughs> uh, it's just a silly way to lose. But um, I'm still in it, so I don't mind so much. All right. Well, uh, hopefully, uh, we get to see some of this newfound uh, ZVP knowledge showcased in the semi-finals against either Hero or uh, Alicia, I believe you'll be up against if you manage to defeat Ryong. Yeah. So, we'll keep an eye out for that one. Now, um, Game 3 against the STC, I feel like that kind of revealed a lot of stylistic trends about your play. So are you particularly concerned that Ryong is going to be kind of like studying that game like a hawk? I mean, that one I think, out of all the games you played in WCS so far, really highlights a lot about you as an individual Zerg player. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, he certainly knows I like Mulisks, and, <laughs> and he knows I like Ultralisks. But I, I think most Zergs do, so I'm not too worried. But uh, he probably, I don't know, I guess he could take advantage of maybe times that I don't scout, or uh, places that I don't scout. Hmm. Um, how greedy I am, and how aggressive I am. Uh, sure. There was definitely, it was definitely a long, long-winded game, and he does know my army composition. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've thought about that a lot, and I, I think I have changed my style a fair bit to, uh, so he won't be completely expecting where I'm going. Cool, glad to hear it. Now, um, for those who didn't catch all of the games, in the round of 32, we actually saw a lot of Roach Hydra play from you, and then in the mm. round of 16, we saw a lot of Ling Bane Muta, so this is uh, really kind of indicative that you are switching it up a lot between each round, so you guys can probably expect to see a lot more new stuff in the round of 8. So, um... This the progress of WCS so far. Correct me if I'm wrong. We have seen uh, Demaga, Stefano, 4GG, MVP, and TLO advance from WCS Europe. They'll all be going to uh, the World Finals in Korea. Um, mm. Korea, being the uh, the host city of the event, gets six seeds to the finals. So there's five from Europe, five from America, and six from Korea. Um, those six Koreans will be Solki, Symbol, uh, Roro, Kangho, Innovation and SOS. So uh, obviously on top of the Americans who make it through this weekend. Now, um, innovation, man. <laughs> Do you mm. see this guy just sweeping through WCS? Is it, is this guy going to lose a game? What do you think? Uh, probably not. <laughs> um, I'm watching him play. He's, he's pretty damn scary. Uh, he's, he's so good at the whole uh, parade pushing. Just, I don't know, it's just something about him. It's just, it's ridiculous. Like, I don't know. It's so hard to beat. You'd have to be either like really aggressive to stop him getting from that state to that stage, or like have some kind of style that's gonna just crush it in these early stages before he can really set up with those minefields and the constant harassing and then the uh, multi like multi prong attacks and drops at the same time. It's just he's really damn good. <laughs> he's pretty scary, man. He's looking very unstoppable at the moment. All right, well, um, enough about WCS for now. Um, obviously, a lot of us back home want to know about your time in New York. I mean, is this the first time you've been to New York? Is that correct? This is the first time, yeah. yeah. It's, um, it's a really, really cool city. It's actually my favorite American city so far, I think. Wow. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's really nice. It's, um, all the streets are, like, numbered, which I found, like, the most awesome thing ever because you just, like, want to look up where to find something. It's on, like... 113th Street, so you just walk up there. Yeah, it's like you three just, blocks away. <laughs> you just, yeah, you, you follow the numbers up the road, and they're like, you're there. So, like, it's it's just really easy to navigate. It's so you know? simple, right? It's common sense. Mm -hmm. You would think everyone would do it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for those of you who don't know, in Australia, out. for our, our capital cities, or at least most of them, I think, we do this convention where we have, like, female names for, like, north-south, and male names for east-west. It's, it's so silly. I don't like it at all. <laughs> So silly, man. Yeah. Should be numbers. Yeah, numbers all the way, man. All right, so um, in New York, I got to ask you, what is what really stands out? Like, what have you seen so far? What have you your uh, your favorite highlights? Is it you know a particular tourist spot? Is it any particular food? Tell us about your experience there so far. Uh, I've heard the food is amazing here, but I haven't really um found any of the amazing food yet. I've been really needing to uh, get someone to show me where it is. But it's probably like the biggest selling point. Like every uh, New Yorker has told me, it's just like the food here is amazing, um, and uh, I believe them. But I haven't found it yet. Um, <laughs> probably when I get to the city tomorrow from the Clarity House, I'll uh, I'll get someone to hook me up. Whoever's there, I'll be like, take me somewhere really good. 
cool. As as for like the sites, uh, Times Square was really damn cool. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really really uh, it's crazy. It's just like TVs everywhere and like big screens showing like ads and like cool stuff and yeah, some cool shops around there and a very very fun place to be. And uh, I thought uh, Central Park was really interesting too. It's a huge like man-made park in the middle of it all and it's just massive and you can hire bikes and like just ride around it and it's it's uh really beautiful and it's just huge it's yeah it's probably my two favorite things so far i also checked out the um empire state building and saw the city it's like so damn high up and it was it was an amazing view but uh yeah it was all right i've seen it before I feel like there's going to be like 50% of the uh, the New York viewers are going to be like, eh, it's boring, we see it all the time. The other 50% yeah. are going to be like falling in love with you, like, oh my god, he loves our city! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a cool city, man. Cool. Alright, now, um, the uh, the shopping in New York, have you bought anything yet? Are you going to be bringing anything back from there? Uh, I'll definitely be doing some shopping. Uh, definitely, I won't with my day off tomorrow, uh, Friday here, before the big match. I like, I like to take a day off just to relax and um, clear my mind a bit. So uh, that'll be my plan. And uh, yeah, I'll just fill it with shopping. And uh, yeah, bring home some nice things. It's a good plan. Alrighty, now um, obviously you spent uh, a decent amount of time in the MLG studio playing those matches. You'll be back there again tomorrow in the MLG apartment. What can you tell us mm. about the, uh, the studio in the apartment? Uh, the apartment is is huge. It has like six bedrooms or something. Wow. It's really nice. And yeah, it's on Madison Avenue and it's like two blocks away from the, the studio. So it's like really easy to get to and from. And um, yeah, it's it's really in like the heart of the city. And it's uh, it's, uh, it's awesome, man. I, I like, though it's, it's, it is noisy there, I'll give it that. Like in the middle of the city, like next to a road, it's like trucks going by at like 4 a.m. and stuff. It's just, I don't know, city life, I guess. But um. <laughs> Yeah, it's really nice apartment. And as for the uh, the MLG studio, it's, it's really nice too. It's in a really nice building up on like the thirty third floor or something. And and uh, it's it's all very nice and clean and awesome studio, uh, awesome place to play, and some uh, some practice computers there too. Um, and obviously, you've seen on the stream, it has like it shows the practice room sometimes between yeah. breaks and stuff. Uh, yeah, it's it's really really cool. And I met Sundance and. All the other MLG guys, and they're all really cool. Awesome. So it's been uh, it's been really fun. That's good, man. Um, on the note of MLG, do you have any uh, any particular feedback, whether it's negative, positive, anything like that, towards MLG or generally uh, or, or WCS in general so far about the entire event, from like a from a Southeast Asian perspective or an Australian perspective, or just as a general spectator, competitor, anything like that? Uh, let me think. Well, I guess the Challenger League qualifiers are at like 3 a.m. out of time. It's always a bad thing. Uh, but I didn't really have to deal with that, so I'm grateful. Uh, besides that, I think it's been, it's been pretty, pretty much all positive, except for maybe getting picked up from the airport was a bit of a drama. But uh, I think it was... But uh, I don't mind too much. I mean, they, they're reimbursing my taxi fare, so who cares? And... Um, no, it's it's been it's been good. So the internet in the apartment has been, I would say, at best below average. It's it's pretty much unplayable. So uh, anyone that was like bringing their like their really good laptops or anything to try and practice in the apartment it just wasn't going to happen. Uh, but besides that, it's 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 been pretty much positive. Uh, oh, and one more thing, they uh they opened the MLG office at like. 12 or 1 p.m. every day, so people have to go kind of like half the half the day without practicing if they if that's what they're relying on, hmm. which is kind of a shame. But they do get they do open to the late, so it's, you still get a good amount of time. In. Okay. Now, um, fortunately, in your case, you've actually been spending the last week in the Clarity Gaming House over at Long Island. So, uh, oh, yeah. can you can you describe the location? Tell us about the house. Who's there? I think we have um, Shoe Shuttle Killer. Uh, is QXC there? I heard he was going to be there. Yep, yep, yeah, he's, he's there here. as well. Uh, any of the other uh. WCS competitors there at the moment? Uh, no, no, it's just it's just me pretty much, which is nice. Okay. Um, I think STC was meant to come, but he didn't end up coming. I think there's probably a lot of space in the um, MLG apartment, so they didn't mm. have to really bother with it. 
Okay. Well, yeah. Uh, um, just tell us about you know the location, the facilities. I mean, a lot of people have never even seen a gaming house, so uh, mm. try to enlighten them a little bit, I guess. Well, it's a really nice big house. Um, two hours out of New York, so it's kind of a bit bit more remote. Uh, but uh, it's it's a really nice place, and um, yeah, it's got great internet, and it's uh, it's a lovely part of. Um, Long Island, or outside of Long Island, maybe by a little bit, and uh, yeah, it's just got rows of computers set up and pretty much people practicing all the time. So it's a uh, it's a really nice house, and um, yeah, it has good play, uh, good people here. I mean, Clarity players are all really cool guys, and the manager. Yeah, so it's it's been a really great experience. Brilliant. I mean, we're both obviously really grateful for Clarity uh, for having you on board while you're in town. Um, obviously providing you with the opportunity to practice, keeping you fed, giving you a place to stay, all that sort of stuff is just fantastic. Um, so we're incredibly grateful. Now, um, have you been practicing with anyone in the house as well in preparation for your match this weekend? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I played a, a ton of games with um, QXC more than anyone. And I played a, a, a few games with Shuttle and a few games with Shu, just to get my ZVP a little bit more practiced. And um, yeah, that's pretty much all I've been those three guys have been playing with a lot, and um, and QXC's also been sourcing me a bunch of uh, Terran players from Europe and uh, America, which has been a great help. So yeah, I've had a I've had a lot of good practice partners. That's fantastic. I'm glad to hear it, man. All right, so um, obligatory balance questions. <laughs> um, uh -huh. the, the current state of balance in Heart of the Swarm. I mean, it's been out for a few months. People who've played around a lot. Some things have been perceived as overpowered, other things perceived as underpowered. We haven't seen a lot of a shake-up in the actual balance, though. So, what do you feel right now? Like, is there anything that really stands out as overpowered, or something's just not being used enough? What are your thoughts? Hmm. Well, I think Void Rays are still very strong. They are manageable, <laughs> but uh, I still think they're very, very strong. And it kind of gets to that point, and a lot of ZVP games where they just have so many void rays, so it's just like, well, he's going to win whenever he decides to attack, unless something really bad happens. Um, so I, I think that they could be changed, which would be really nice. Uh, but besides that, I don't know, um, it's it's looking okay. I mean, Widow Mines can still be like a real pain in the ass sometimes, uh, but uh, besides that, it's it's not too bad. The whole uh, the spore buff was really nice. It's it kind of stopped the muters a fair bit. Like you can't really just run in and like start killing stuff while tanking a spore because you just lose your muters like three shots. So <laughs> I like that. Uh, nothing too too blatant to be honest. I'm I'm kind of enjoying it right now. Okay. The Terran is very difficult. I mean medivacs and mines, um, yeah. but it's not not unbeatable. Now, um, as for the Void Ray, if you could change it, or tweak it, or just rebalance it a little bit, what angle would you take? Would you just reduce its damage against non-armored units, or, I mean, how would you approach that? Uh, I, I guess the best thing to do would be, like, give Zerg a unit that can actually kill it. Because <laughs> um, we have Corruptors, but... And there must be, like, air-to-air, -air, anti air but... To be honest, they're freaking useless. Um, and they get completely raped by Void Rays. So, uh, fixing the Corruptor could probably solve the problem. Mm. But, um, I don't know, besides that, yeah, just reduce the damage. So, like, Hydras can kill them, or something can kill them. Yeah. Because, it, kind of like having it being able to, like, kill everything is kind of ridiculous. Yeah. Now, um, for those of you who haven't really been following the latest trends in, uh, in PvZ or ZVP, vice versa, um, the only way we're really seeing Zergs deal with this late game composition, this kind of really Void Ray heavy, supported by the typical Colossus Death Ball formula, is by kind of dancing around the Protoss army with Hydralisks and Corruptors and Vipers. Vipers are the key unit. They're abducting these Void Rays, whittling down their numbers slowly, pulling one or two out of the pack, picking them off, running them away, and rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. That's the only real successes we've seen uh, in the global scene so far fighting against this composition, and of course, you can only run so far, right? Like, if the Protoss brings the fight to your doorstep, what are you going to do? You're going to mm -hmm. hide behind spine crawlers and spore crawlers, so we're seeing yeah. a lot of people struggling with it. Well, like, if you, um, like, eventually when they get the ball big enough and they have, like, Storm behind it, like, 
it's pretty much impossible to even poke them because they'll storm your army and feed back your vipers and um, kill everything. So you really have to just go into that super boring swarm host spore crawler infester mode and just sit there and like whittle them away slowly and sadly. <laughs> it's a good way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, um, the only thing we have left for this interview is the Q and A. So we've got a bunch of questions from uh, fans who've obviously been following your journey throughout the WCS so far. Um, cool. The first question we actually have is: uh, When did you first start playing StarCraft? So, like the original StarCraft. Like, how old were you? How long ago was it? Can you remember back that far? <laughs> uh, it's probably like year seven of primary school. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> I guess. When vanilla was out, for sure. Uh, obviously, like ten or twelve years ago now, maybe yeah. thirteen years. Uh, so I started to play it then, but I didn't really like hardcore play it. I was kind of like hopping between like StarCraft, Diablo, Warcraft two, and then I kind of moved on to Warcraft three, and then back to StarCraft one, and then jumped into StarCraft two when it came out. So okay. yeah. Now um. For those of you who don't know, uh, he wasn't always calling himself Moonglade. Back in the original StarCraft, he called himself Dead <laughs> Rock. Yeah. Do you, have, uh, do you have any explanation? Like, what was what was the idea behind the ID Dead Rock? What did it mean to you? Well, me and my friend, uh, we decided to just make stupid names, and um, he was he was like Faded White, and I was like well, Faded White and Dark Black, and I was um, yeah, I was just like I think of something stupid too, and I, I chose Dead Rock. <laughs> And that's that's what stuck, man. It's a pretty sweet name. I'm glad you've moved on to something else. So, um, obviously, <laughs> uh, people are obviously going to wonder the name Moonglade. Uh, most people will attribute that to... These days, they'll attribute to uh, a zone in World of Warcraft. Obviously, Ugh. it originated a little bit earlier than that. So, yes. the, the map in Warcraft 3, Moonglade, that is 100% where the ID came from, right? Pretty much. Uh, it started off as just a smurf. Smurf account, uh, and I capitalized it to make it look sexy, and then I was like, it was sexy enough to become my uh, my main account. So uh, I pretty much stuck with it since then. Um, not very creative, I must admit. I mean, named after a really crappy Warcraft 3 map. But, well, that was terrible, man. Everything poisoned you on that map. <laughs> everything poisoned you, man. And like the the mercenaries were imbalanced. You know, <laughs> it was bad, bad times. But uh. Yeah, that's pretty much where it came from. I think it looks pretty cool, and it's pretty memorable, I think. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I'm it's pretty happy world, with it. Man. It's a good name. All right, so the next question we have is, what was the first game you remember playing as a child? Tank Wars. Tank Wars? Oh, is that the Tank. one where you, it's like worms, but you you can't move? Yeah. You just have that one shot, and you got to angle it. and Dude, yeah. I played that so much. Dude. Yeah, I used to play it with my friends back when we were kids, man. We were like eight years old playing Tank Wars. I <laughs> uh, loved it, man. I was pretty good at it too, I think. Yeah, that game was the bomb. Cool. That's, That's my first. Hear. Very good choice. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, you have... This is the next question. You visited a lot of countries in your travels. I mean, you've been to, off the top of my head, you've been to uh, LA, you've been to Korea, you've been to uh, a lot of different destinations in Europe. I think you've been to China as well. Is that Yeah, you've been to China. Yeah, Shanghai. Yeah. Do you have a, a favorite destination, whether it be a country or a city? I mean, obviously you said earlier that New York is looking to be your favorite uh, city in America, but what about in mm. the whole world? Japan. Yeah. <laughs> I love Japan, man. I've been there three times and it hasn't been for StarCraft. I just, <laughs> it's just for, uh, just for a holiday and it's been my favorite every time. So uh, that that's definitely it. Are you planning um, on going to Japan again this year? Uh, maybe at the end of the year, if uh, if I do well in tournaments and there's money in my pocket. <laughs> I'll, uh, okay. Uh, but, um, yeah, we'll see. Cool. Now, we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but, um, you know, we can kind of branch out and expand this question. The question was basically, what places have you eaten in New York and what would you recommend to visitors? So let's just expand on that and say... Uh, you know, memorable places that you've eaten anywhere in the world and places wow. you know, that really stand out to you. The best food mm. you've had in the world, man. That's hard, man. That's hard. <laughs> I, I, I can't say that I've had, like, really fantastic food experiences for most of my trips. Mm. Uh, usually it's, like, for, like, an IAM, it's, like, whatever's nearby. 
because you don't speak the language and you don't really know anyone and you're in like a time frame so it's like they're selling like hot dogs at the IAM venue and you eat that shit so uh, <laughs> but besides that um, well Japan is always amazing food so does Korea I, uh, South Korea is always um, has always had great food very healthy food too uh, so I'd say those two countries for sure. But anywhere in there, like you could pretty much go anywhere in Japan or Korea and you'd get good food. Uh, you'd be hard pressed to find anywhere that's really bad. Um, I had a memorable experience in LA at IHOP. They're pretty fun. It's yeah. like pancakes and stuff. Ooh. Not too bad, man. It's like it's like open 24-7. You just get, go there anytime and just get pancakes and bacon and shit. <laughs> Uh, it's nice that um, Singapore has great food. Yeah. Uh, pretty much anywhere. Also, it's like it's hard pressed to find very bad food from my limited experience. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. let's flip the question around. For people who are coming to Australia, your home country, mm. Uh, mm. do you have any particular places that you would recommend people go for food? Uh, well, in, usually when I grab the food, it's usually like two Korean restaurants. So, uh, <laughs> uh, if you're in if you're in Queen Street, or like if you're in Brisbane, you go to like Maru or Mad Tong San too, or Funny Funny. Those places, <laughs> if you want to have some delicious Korean food. Good recommendations. <coughs> All right. Um, another question here. I think this one actually came from Chad Man. Uh, he says, The day will eventually come where you will have to hang up the mouse and move on with your life. <laughs> where or, uh, you know, like, where do you see yourself or where would you like to see yourself in, like, maybe five years, ten years? Like, what's what's the ultimate goal for you? Is it still something related to esports or the gaming industry? That's a good question, Chad Man. And uh, it's, some, it's a question that I've thought about many a time, especially after I've lost... I'd be like, what am I gonna do now? So, uh, hmm, it's it's. I still haven't figured it out, to be honest. Maybe I go back and study and uh, look for like a, a real job, or I don't know if there's really like a, a place in esports, especially in Australia, after mm. like being a competitive gamer. Um, it doesn't doesn't really seem like there is, um, but I'd have to uh, I'd have to really consider it a whole lot more. But yeah, pretty much like it's either study, get a job, or try and find somewhere in esports, but I, I'm not very hopeful of that. I feel like internationally you'd probably have a lot of opportunities, whether it be, um, I mean, we see these days so many opportunities for like commentary or just hosts, analysts. You know, there is a lot of niche positions that are opening up for ex gamers mm. or ex competitive gamers and that sort of thing. So, That's very um, true. I mean, internationally, I think, yeah, you'd definitely have a, a wide range of options. Yeah, casting. I haven't really thought about too much. I'm not really entirely sure if I'm a, if I would be a good caster or not. Uh, I don't know if I'm that exciting. <laughs> but, um, I guess if anyone's interested in that, I, I could take that opportunity too. Let's I think, wait and uh, see. I think your time on the commentary desk at numerous IEMs has received a pretty, uh, pretty positive reception. So, hey, might be an mm. opportunity there. Mm, maybe, maybe. All right, now, this is a question that so many people threw at me, and I really didn't want to ask it, but so many people ask, so I have to do it, right? Is it about, is it about shampoo? Yes, they want to know your shampoo and conditioner. <laughs> Thank God, I knew it. <laughs> uh, um, it kind of varies. I don't really have a go-to product. It's kind of just wash it daily and look after your hair and brush it. And don't use too much shampoo and don't use too much conditioner. And only condition the ends of your hair. Otherwise, your hair gets really greasy. Wisdom. That's, that's all you gotta know, really. Um, <laughs> you can use pretty much anything unless it like dries out your hair or some shit. So, um, it's not hard. You just gotta <laughs> brush it and wash it. And you there can have you hair guys. like this. There is, <laughs> there is the hot tips right there. You too can look like this. <laughs> Alright, so... Uh, question from Infezza this time. He wants to know your favorite TV show. So I'm going to expand on it a little bit. I'm going to ask uh, your favorite TV show right now, currently. Uh, what do you look forward to most? Whether it's a current season that's running or something that's, you know, you're waiting for the next season to arrive. 
Uh, and then on top of that, what is your favorite TV show of all time? So maybe something you really enjoyed when you were younger and, you know, the show's obviously been canceled, or what do you got there? Uh, massive fan of Game of Thrones and Mad Men. Those two kind of tie at the moment. Uh, really big fan of both of them. Uh, as for as for the, the past, hmm, that's a hard decision. Uh, trying to think back on what I've really enjoyed. I used to like Supernatural. Used to. It's kind of <laughs> gone a little, a little too far now. Um, I honestly, like a lot of shows I just watch and just forget whether they be good or bad. Um, I would stick with Game of Thrones though, because I love the book so much and the TV adaption is has been fantastic. So I'm gonna say that's my overall favorite. Cool. Well, I haven't seen it personally. I'm kind of the guy that rocks up and watches a show like four years after it's come out, and then I'm like, oh my god, this show is so great! And everyone's like, wow, yeah. we're really over that. Stop talking yeah, about well, it. Well, it's it's <laughs> good that you don't have to wait for um the next episode because it's always a killer yeah so yeah I've heard uh, highly a lot of people claiming that you look like one of the characters from the show is there any truth behind that or are they really stretching it I look like one of the characters which did they tell you which one uh, I don't know I'd have to have a look at Twitter that they went kind of crazy about it during WCS <laughs> really yeah oh, interesting I don't know who it could be to be honest hmm. I'll look um, it up and I'll let yeah, you know you let me know man <laughs> Alrighty, so, but people um, say I, people say I look like everything, man. It's they, true. they said everything. It's just, like, <laughs> just because like someone has long hair, I look like them. Apparently. <laughs> Why wow, you look like Gwen Stefani? <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard that one yet. But. <laughs> All right. So next question. This is actually um, some pretty hard hitting questions from Tegan. He wants to know what's your opinion on the community's interpretation of uh, of teams, the the player salaries and practice schedules, like that whole dynamic. The really the really grisly detail kind of behind the scenes stuff that happens in esports that a lot of people aren't tremendously exposed to but they mm. they kind of sort of hear a lot about it, you know what i mean so what what's your opinion on you know the com the community's perspective there their perspective on the teams like well none of them really know for sure how much anyone makes or like or how much they practiced, or anything like that. I think I saw Tegan tweet you that question. So it's kind of like what they think of it, like. Yeah. So I guess they, like, what do you perceive? Like, you look at the community, and what do you think their perspective is? What do you think they know or see about you, uh, about team dynamics, about your salaries and pra practice schedules, and all that sort of stuff? Oh, okay. Well, I f I feel like they don't really know anything, and they assume a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. and um. Uh, I think 99% of the time they're wrong. <laughs> uh, it's just like, a, but there's no information for them to have, so they can only really like guess on what's going on. So um, yeah. I don't know. It's it's a lot of uh, misinformation I feel, and a lot of um, just just uh, fabricated thoughts and the whole thing. So yeah. uh, I don't know. It's like a lot of ignorance out there. Um, I haven't really. I don't honestly don't read much into the community or uh, or what they think of anyone. Because usually it's, there's a lot of negativity um, anywhere, to be honest. Uh, I've even had times where I've read like SC2C and felt pretty bad after mm -hmm. it. So I I generally stay away from it. I think the uh, the um, tasteless approach is a pretty good one. <laughs> I think if you if you are a person that's getting commented about, then definitely the tasteless approach is the best way because yeah. you can end up feeling pretty sad unless you've got thick skin. Yeah. So yeah, I generally stay away from it. Yeah. Well, uh, I have to agree. I mean, um, it's it's a topic that I've been writing um, pretty adamantly about recently. Um, you know, the, the community perspective in a lot of cases is, uh, I guess you could say, like you said, very misinformed, and it's based on hearsay and speculation. I mean, how many times have we seen the phrase six-figure salary thrown around on Reddit, right? Like, no yeah. one actually knows these things, but all of a sudden, like, every second pro gamer is earning a six-figure salary, and no one's got the, the <laughs> actual transparency there to to indicate that there's any facts behind that, so I think it's, yeah. uh, it's a really good point. Cool. Uh, we have another question from Tegan um, asking uh, about the conditions on tournaments that you've participated in. So, you know, what was the best and what was the worst? And obviously you've attended more tournaments than anyone else in Australia, so you're obviously a good candidate to answer this sort of question. Hmm. Um, 
worst. I, it's probably easy to name the worst. The best. There's like never really like. I guess if like it's the internet's fine, the computer's fine, the lighting is fine, then it's like they're all kind of like on the same level of decent. But uh, the worst that comes to mind would have to be WCS last year in Shanghai because the room that everyone had to play in that wasn't on stage. Uh, there was no lighting at all, so you were playing in the complete darkness, wow. except for the, the monitor. And it had like terrible um, cloth that, like, uh, if your gear was like slippery at all, could like crease it and like move it. Um, yeah, that would probably be my least least favorite of all the tournaments I've played. Um, another probably probably negative one would probably be like open bracket MLGs because it's it's just so freaking hardcore but it's not really their fault it's more like just the structure of the tournament it's it's so long and draining um, especially coming from Australia it's just like you're fighting jet lag and you're you're fighting like 12 hour days of Starcraft yeah Uh, Yeah, I gotta say um, those guys they run a really tight ship I mean the mm. way they operate is fantastic Um, but the schedule is just so long I mean you hear you know, people like Tasteless Nartosis talking about how you've got these different tournament dynamics where you've got stuff like the GSL where you've you got like a whole week in advance to study your next opponent, play that match, and that's it. That's all that matters. And then mm. on the flip side, you've got stuff like MLG Open Bracket, which is just a marathon of playing, 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 playing for like 14 hours in a whole day. So, yeah, I mean, exactly that, man. Absolutely, man. Um, trying to think of more, uh, honestly... Like everywhere else has been pretty much fine. I've never really had any serious complaints. I'm not the kind of guy to freak out over a wobbly table. Uh, <laughs> um, no, everywhere else has been reasonable. Like the MLG studio is is really nice. It's um, there is a bit of lighting, like crazy lighting, like flashing and like stuff, like lights going everywhere. But uh, it's right before the game. So I guess as long as you don't look at the lights while you're like getting ready, you're fine. But uh, it's it's all pretty good. I'm pretty happy. Cool. Uh, yeah, I remember uh, uh, Todd did like a an article recently, right? About uh, yeah, yeah. I think that's probably what inspired the question. I honestly haven't read the article yet. Um, it's quite but, good. Uh, you know, it's really I mean, detailed. Oh, that's good. But uh, obviously, uh, I feel well. I can I can tell you like what I don't like about any tournament, which is like fucking cloths on tables is mm. just pointless. <laughs> it's not helpful at all unless like the table like actually can cut your arm or something with the edge. Yeah. Uh, it's it's actually like a massive hindrance. Um, poor lighting is terrible. Uh, if there's bad computers, that's probably the worst thing of all. Yeah. Um, it's pretty much un... It's like no excuse for having bad computers that can't run StarCraft. It's not even that demanding. Uh, I mean, chairs can be an issue if they're like really like budget, like fold up chairs or some crap. But uh, I haven't had many tournaments like that. Um, wobbling table, I can't say I really have an issue with because I'm not like slamming the desk or anything, or, like pushing the desk. I'm, I'm all I'm doing is moving a mouse and typing. So like. Hmm. Table shouldn't wobble really, even if it's a bit dodgy. Um, uh, I guess one other thing would be like, as long as there's a barrier between like players and everywhere else, like it's annoying as shit if someone's like walking into your per- peripheral vision, like as you're playing like a serious game, and like they're like right there. Hmm. It's very distracting. Yeah. Um, same if people like hitting a chair from behind or something. Oh yeah. Pet peeve of uh, mine. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. It's, it's brutal. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, besides that, these things never really happen anymore. Um, I can't say I have any, have any like, major complaints as of recent. Cool. That's very insightful. Thank you. Um, next question we have. <laughs> Another bit of a, a novel one. Um, the hair flick moment. <laughs> it's garnered <laughs> a lot of attention. What was going through <laughs> your mind at that exact moment? Uh, Axel Toss told me to do it to be honest um, he was like uh, because we had some downtime and like he was typing to me in the channel uh, he's like you should do a hair flick man and I was like uh, how do I know when the camera's on me and he's like I'll tell you when 
<laughs> and like so like pretty much like he told me when the camera was on me and so I, I just went for it <laughs> and it, it worked out well it's been a while since I've done one so I was pretty happy with uh, the performance yeah I think it's gonna last you a while man it was pretty successful <laughs> <laughs> I just hope people don't expect me to do it every time so <laughs> He's not that kind of guy. <laughs> only if only if I win, maybe I'll do it. But okay. otherwise, we'll be watching that. <laughs> um, next question. Uh, uh, this is actually one from Loach, and it kind of trails back to the question from Chad Man earlier. Um, was there any point in time where you thought that pro gaming or getting into pro gaming uh, initially was a mistake, and do you have any regrets pursuing it? Uh. Never a mistake, never any regrets. Uh, it's pretty much what I've always wanted to do, and I did it. So, like, how can I have regrets with that? Um, I started it when I was like in high school. Like, it was kind of just like a good escape from from like reality and from doing school work and shit. So, uh, I did that for, <laughs> and like, I kind of found that I was pretty good at RTS games or Warcraft Three in general. Uh, and um, I kind of just went with it from there. And I really enjoyed doing it. Um, even though like Warcraft 3 scene was obviously completely minute in Australia compared to everywhere else, and getting out of Australia was very very difficult. But um, but uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed that. And then obviously uh, I waited until StarCraft 2 came out to make another big go of it. You know, been loving it ever since. I mean, obviously there's times where you like kind of look back and you're you're like thinking like. Maybe I should do something else if you're not doing very well. Like, but I don't know. It's, I'm still just playing a game for a living, so I can't really complain. It's cool, man. I mean, it makes me really, really happy to hear something like that because so often you hear pro gamers responding to that question and they kind of hesitate a little bit. You know, they say, oh, you know, it's, it's been great, but if I wasn't doing this, then, you know, I'd go and do this and this and this. Like, they've clearly already had that moment of hesitation somewhere along their, uh, their career where they've actually stopped to think about maybe it's time that I go and do this other thing. So, you know, it's really well, cool to hear someone say with, like, 100% certainty, yeah, no regrets. Yeah, well, why would you regret it, man? It's like, I've managed to travel the world for StarCraft without paying a cent, and I've, I've won some tournaments, and I've met a lot of people, made a lot of friends, seen a lot of places that I probably wouldn't have saw if I started working. Uh, I honestly probably wouldn't have seen anywhere if I started working. Um, so I'm... I'm very happy with how my life's been, and yeah, I, hopefully it keeps going this way. You're living the dream, man. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of uh, a lot of gamers, even those at the top tier uh, in Australia, who have admitted that you were their their initial inspiration for getting into StarCraft in the first place, because they saw there's this an Australian guy who's going around touring the world, loving it, and they said, "I want to be that guy." So really cool to see. Uh, next question: um, What you listen to when you're laddering? Uh, do, is it different from what you listen to when you really want to get pumped up before a match? I mean, I know that when I've watched your stream, you listen to everything from like K-pop, the the, the Tron uh, soundtrack, the Inception soundtrack, and then you know we look at WCS Oceana last year, and your theme song was like that that Street Fighter theme song. So uh, <laughs> you know, what do you got? <laughs> uh, I, it's pretty much whatever like whatever I really enjoy at the moment. Um, well, I've been playing here. I've been listening to like K-pop again, so it kind of goes, went full circle. Uh, but uh, usually, like before and during like a tournament, I won't listen to anything. Um, it's purely just pure silence and concentration for that. It's kind of like, like even like when I'm practicing and like I'm having a frustrating moment, the last thing I want is to hear like music, like in my ear, like while I'm stressed out. So it, it kind of can work against you too. But um, yeah, I pretty much listen to. Uh, whatever the hot thing is at the moment. Um, K-pop currently, but uh, I'm sure it'll go back to like Tron sometime soon, because I haven't listened to them in a long time. Thank you for remembering me. <laughs> me. Alright, cool. Well, I guess that kind of flows on to our next uh, question very directly. Um, you talked about how, you know, before a match you won't listen to any music or whatever. Um, do you have any other specific sort of pre-game routine? Like, um, you know, anything psychological, physical, um, anything you drink or eat in advance, you know, anything that really, really has become more of a, a psychological habit for for uh, your own preparation. Uh, I drink a lot of water, mm -hmm. and if I'm very, very tired, obviously not alcohol. Uh, 
if I'm very, very uh, tired, I maybe I'll like, have like an energy drink, as long as I have like a lot of water with it. Um, yeah, that's probably like my biggest thing. And when I've just started, like the first game of the series, I always force myself to play slow because uh, with the like adrenaline, I'm like I don't want to be all over the place. So like I, I really try and slow myself down and play like as slow as I can play for that excited moment and um, kind of just gain control and breathe slowly. Hmm. And this is pretty much just like how I um, how I deal with nerves uh, at the start of the first game of the series. Like uh, when I was playing like SDC and stuff, I had to. Uh, just take a moment, like slow it down, and just think and prepare myself. Hmm. I do that. I do that before every game, pretty much. It's fascinating. I've never heard anyone say that before. I um, think it's really helpful because people get so jittery at the start of a game, and like, if you're nervous as hell, you're just gonna you're gonna cock something up, or you're just gonna I don't know. You, you waste a lot of energy that you shouldn't. Just clicking and being really fast. Yeah. Well, uh, that kind of segues conveniently, <laughs> straight into my next question. Now, um, we often hear a lot of speculation on players' nerve situation in a tournament, so, I mean, I think commentators very often will, uh, will kind of just, you know, fabricate their interpretation of how nervous a player can be. So, mm. you personally, I mean, you're a veteran to the, the international tournament scene, thanks to Warcraft 3 and now Starcraft 2. You've played on the, uh, on the international stage so many times, do you ever get nervous? I mean, we've seen you go as far as just narrowly missing out on a podium position at the IEM World Championships two years ago. That's probably, you know, your biggest run globally. Um, and this weekend we may very well see you go even further. I dare say this is technically further than that, considering the skill ceiling since uh, IEM those many years ago. So, uh, yeah, I mean, nerves, do you still get them uh, psychologically? Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um I think I'm I'm pretty good at dealing with them there compared to I don't know like the young guns they they're all like freaking out and stuff and they make some bad plays, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, no I, I think I, I deal with them pretty well I, I've never really freaked out for a very long time maybe like my first WCG for Warcraft three in like 2004 I, I freaked out a bit but I still played it right um, but since then I, I felt like I really had like decent control of what I'm meant to be doing and how to just keep it under control and use it to my advantage because I feel like when I'm really nervous and I, f I feel like I play a whole lot better and I play a lot more, um, I play a mu much more focused game and a, and a much longer game like I, I never give up when I'm like in those kind of situations. That's why like my game is against the SDC and all that just went for so long because I was just like, just like never had a thought of like stopping, I was just playing my best to the very end, and um, I don't know, I feel like I just have a lot better focus in those situations. It's good man, obviously it's uh, a very powerful weapon to have in your arsenal. Alrighty, um, we have just a few questions left, uh, the next one is, uh, hypothetically, you are in a million dollar tournament final, who are you oh. playing against, and why? Who's your opponent? In a, in a million dollar final? Yep. It's the grand final of this million dollar tournament. Playing against Innovation because he's <laughs> freaking good. And I'm going to beat him because I want that million dollars. <laughs> it's a good answer. A lot of people would be like, uh... And then they just like pick some no-name player. <laughs> oh, right, right. Is that what I should have done? All no, right. I mean... I was being realistic. Like, that's, that's a good way to go about it, right? Because if you win, it's like, whoa! And if you lose, it's like, well, it's innovation, so, you know, well, it's okay. You gotta think of, like, the greatest victory ever. It's like, yeah. I, I'm gonna win a million dollars, I gotta beat innovation for it, yeah, right? You wanna earn it, man. If I beat him, then, like, that's, like, even better than beating some no-name random. <laughs> because if you beat that no-name random, everyone on the internet's gonna be like, well, you beat a no-name random for a million dollars. Yeah. Good work. Yeah. See, it won't even feel good. Exactly. It's all about that satisfaction. And then the yeah. dollars. <laughs> and then the dollars. Alrighty. Um, this will probably be our last question. Um, mm -hmm. I guess it's, it's kind of already been answered, uh, but we'll kind of mold it into something a little more approachable. Um, your preparation in the Clarity Gaming House throughout the last week, uh, how has it really differed from your preparation, say, you know, spending 
five days in Germany or, you know, a week in, in uh, Poland or any of the other destinations you traveled for a tournament, has it really made a significant difference to your practice or has it just been like a lot more of a comforting environment? Uh, I feel like it's been a lot more focused this time around, more than any other time I've really practiced. Um, a lot of the time I'm favoring ladder more than anything else, and, um, but this time it's been a whole lot of custom games and I've never really done that before. Uh, so it's hopefully it pays off. Um, I definitely found out my weaknesses, um, and yeah, it's just a matter of fixing all those problems when I play Rion. Um, it's very it's a very nice way to practice. I, I should definitely do it more when I'm home, but uh, obviously there's ping issues and stuff. But uh, it should be alright with the, at least the American guys. Um, yeah, but it's just been a whole pretty much a new experience for me. I, I've never custom so much. Cool. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been really good. That's really good, man. I mean, we often hear a lot of people speculating and questioning the actual benefits of a team house and a team environment, um, and you know how much benefit does it really yield to the players. So it's good to hear some kind of uh, some first-hand experience in the in the matter. So thank you. I think it's I think it's a very, very, very positive, especially if you have all the tools in the house, like every player from every race, and they all speak English and they're all able to help you. Um, it's like a new experience for me, and it's, uh, and I think it's definitely one way to get to a great improvement. Cool. All right, man. Well, um, we don't want to take any more of your time. You've obviously got a little bit more practice to squeeze in before you spend tomorrow shopping, and then the day after, <laughs> hopefully killing a bunch of nerds. Um, so we'll uh, give you a quick moment just uh, to throw out any shout-outs, you know, messages to your fans, uh, friends and family, even fellow Australians. Yep. Uh, Shout-out to... Uh Shout out to my team NV, obviously. Uh, you guys are all awesome. Thank you for getting me to New York. <laughs> um, shout out to uh, Libby B and all the Aussies watching and getting up at 3 a.m. to cheer me on. Uh, I, hopefully, I won't let you down. I do some real damn games. And uh, shout out to everyone who supports me and follows me. And, uh, thanks a lot for the interview. Um, for those of you wanting to tune into the broadcast live, it is going to be uh, going up at 3 a.m. this Sunday in Australian Eastern Time. Um, for those of you tuning in internationally, obviously you can check out uh, Team Liquid and all of the obvious uh, WCS correspondents for the time zones, your, uh, your recording time zones. Um, there is also uh, a Barcraft live in New York. For those of you who are capable of attending, make sure you swing by. It's like one block away uh, from the MLG studio. So you, can, you guys can head down there, see the games live, and then Moonglade himself will be coming to the Barcraft oh, later yeah. on after the matches. You can hang out with him, ask him any questions that uh, you know we might have missed tonight, and of course just you know have a chat with the guy. He's pretty chill. He's pretty cool. So yeah, make sure you head on down to that. Um, if you're chasing the Barcraft details, check out our Team Liquid Reddit. You'll see the details all over the place there, uh, undoubtedly. So um, I think that's about it. We can wrap it up. Thanks again to Plantonics Gamecom. Um, obviously, competing around the world would not be possible without them. And of course, thank you to Frag Labs and Horize for providing Moonglade with the tools he needs to stay practiced on the move. Thank you for tuning in, and thanks, Andy, for the time.